welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, joining this afternoon. Uh, I'm Nigel Mason. Um, I can see from the people who are joining, most of you know me, but just for those who haven't, uh, I am a professor in starting off in molecular physics, although over the years I've merged from a physicist to a chemist, to an astronomer, to maybe an astrobiologist. Um, I'm currently based at the University of Kent. Uh, prior to that, I was at the Open University, uh, from which many of you will know me. Uh, many of you also will know me as the uh, coordinator of the Europlanet Research Infrastructure Programme, um, which is um, now in its fourth inclination um, and very much incorporates some um, aspects of astrobiology. This afternoon, the title of my talk is Astrochemistry, the Cradle of Life. And I want to concentrate upon the chemistry aspects which underpin a lot of the things that we do in astrobiology. Now, all of this is based upon the tenets of the EAI. And I was, again, fortunately with Wolf, one of the people who helped to try and get that going. Um, and we're delighted to see how many people are joining it and participating in EAI activities like this. And the two questions we, we kind of flag are where and how did life begin on Earth? And is there life elsewhere in the universe? And these two central questions have a lot of tenants and resonances, not only with ourselves as scientists, but also with the general public and indeed with the politicians. And we were fortunate to talk to some of the politicians just a couple of weeks ago on uh, what excitement areas that can happen in modern science. But if we want to ask these as uh, scientific questions rather than philosophical questions, we have to sort of string them into the following. Are the conditions for sustaining life, brackets as we know it, common throughout the universe? And how is the material for life, however we wish to define life, the material, the chemical ingredients, if you like, the prebiotic material formed? And that's where we come in to talk about the chemistry and the chemical origins of life. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 50 or so minutes. So first of all, we have to consider what, what, what we talk about the chemical elements of life. And we tend to focus that on DNA, the molecule that, that, that we know is the molecule of life, where the major elements are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which people tend to forget, but the phosphorus group is absolutely brutal. And I'll also add one to that uh, very important one for, for life, which is sulfur. Um, but DNA is made up of uh, lots of uh, other molecules. And when we want to talk about how the molecules are assembled to make molecules like DNA, we need to think about all those other kind of molecules that make up life um, as we know it. So amino acids, fatty acids, the nuclear bases, the carbohydrates, etc., all of which are kind of essential if we're trying to understand the formation of the first cell, the structure of the cell with its cell membrane, et cetera. And so we really want to look at how those are formed. Now, for the actual synthesis of the elements themselves, the atoms themselves, the nuclear synthesis, uh, today is actually a bit of a landmark day because apart from having uh, the Euro Planet Research Infrastructure in Europe to bring together people working in the planetary sciences aspects, Today is the launch of another research infrastructure in nuclear astrophysics. And that's very much focused on trying to understand how we make the carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the heavier elements as part of the nuclear synthesis. So I'm not going to talk about that today, uh, partly because I don't really, uh, I'm not an expert in supernovae, et cetera, but it's important. What I am going to talk about today is how the more complex molecules which we need that will gradually assemble in some way to form the life as we know it, are made. And for that, we have to go into space and we have to look into the interstellar medium. Now, currently, uh, we are going through a renaissance, uh, or maybe not even a renaissance, a new period of looking for molecules and finding molecules in these dark, cold regions of space, the interstellar medium. Um, I think this is an up-to-date number, although did somebody did send me a, 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 an email this morning saying that another two molecules have been seen. So I know it's 230 individual molecular species have been seen, comprised of 16 elements, 
and they range in size from the very simplest hydrogen through to atoms of up to 70. And, and just this year alone, to give you some idea in the way in which our community is, is rapidly uh, developing um, its astrochemical implications, these are just some of the molecules that have been reported in the literature since January, uh, mainly through the development of the big new telescopes, ALMA telescopes and other telescopes. But let's give you a kind of a rich flavor of some of the molecules we, we're seeing. And they're mainly uh, the uh, carbon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen compounds, which we are now detecting in ever increasing numbers. And in reality, the, 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 we can put together a little bit of a table of some of the molecules that, we're, that we've seen. Um, I just want to point out some, which, 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 which you know, you kind of think, oh gosh, how are they made? Formic acid, um, ants, we get them, of course, on Earth, we squash our ants and we make some formic acid. That's been seen in the interstellar medium. A good odor acetic acid or vinegar has been seen in the interstellar medium. And uh, glycolaldehyde, a simple sugar, that's all been seen out there in space. And maybe the ones we want to look at, the more simple prebiotic ones like glycine, maybe that's being seen, although there's still some debate about whether that. But we have definitely seen molecules like benzene in the ring compound. And we've seen some of these cyanopolanes, as you just saw recently, these very long chain molecules, which we don't find naturally on Earth, but certainly form out there in the regions of space. So the big question for us is, how on Earth are these molecules formed? And we don't really know that. That is the purpose of astrochemistry, is to work out how, what chemistry could occur in space, in the interstellar medium, or indeed on planetary surfaces, or in planetary atmospheres, or on comets, or any other body, that could lead to the formation of such complex molecules from very simple ingredients. And we like to think about this in two ways, either a top-down or a bottom-up. So top-down means that we, we know we've got a lot of dust, as we're going to see out there in a the moment, and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, have been forecast and seen in space for, for several decades. Um, they're large compounds made up of rings and so on. They could break down to make these smaller compounds. Or alternatively, we can start with the very simple molecules, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and somehow we can sort of build them up to get to the molecules that we want to see and do indeed see. Now, exploring this chemical synthesis has been with us for a long time. And as an experimentalist, um, I can go back really to the kind of classic first experiment, which most of us were, have, have heard about or, or maybe even have seen in, 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 in teaching laboratories or in, in videos, certainly. The famous Uwe Miller or the Mirror Uwe experiment, uh, where they, they came up with the first idea that you could basically uh, just take a planetary atmosphere, and, and they thought about what an early Earth's atmosphere might be, comprised of water circulating from the oceans, and an atmosphere with methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. And if we could create some kind of energy source in that uh, atmosphere, like, for example, lightning, then maybe that energy source would lead to the formation of more complicated molecules, particularly, say, glycine and other amino acids. And this is the original picture from, the, from one of their, their papers, just showing how you do that experiment. And they did it, and they ran that experiment for about a week, and they extracted the liquid from the flask at the end of it, and they analyzed it with very simple terms in those days, the, the, the chromatography paper, and they discovered uh, at least three um, amino acids, glycine and the two alanines. Indeed, um, Miller only died a few years ago, and when they were clearing his office, they found many of these original vials that he kept and he'd sealed with wax. And of course, we can now put them through much more sensitive GCMS and so on machines. And indeed, it was found that there weren't just three acid, amino acids, there are actually many, many more, 12 or more amino acids could be made. And we've run many of the experiments since to show that. The problem is that 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 isn't actually a very good mimic of the early Earth's atmosphere. Um, there was a lot going on in the early Earth. We had volcanic eruptions and so on. So there are other molecules that were being put into that uh, mix, carbon dioxide and particularly sulfur, 
sulfur dioxide. Um, and if you run those experiments with those mixtures, you actually decrease the yield of the amino acids you make. But the biggest problem is that if you kind of run a model of this and you think about how much of these molecules uh, are and how long it would take to form them, the model will basically tell you that, that there's no way that you'll make the amount of material that we need for the amount of life that is evolved on Earth in any time scale, which is commensurate with our origins of life as far as we know it, um, say 3.8 billion years ago, let alone even today. So clearly that that is a possible mechanism, but it wasn't it isn't a mechanism that 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 really explains the facts that we have. So the alternative, and indeed probably the one that we now believe to be more true, is that uh, life on any planet, including the Earth, uh, didn't have to wait for the molecules to be assembled on Earth. We actually brought some of those simple molecules to Earth, for example, on uh, asteroids and comets. And um, we have some evidence for that, because if we look at meteorites and we open up a meteorite and we cut open a meteorite, it is full uh, of uh, rather rich molecular chemistry. Um, and um, indeed, um, some of you will know that there was a recent meteorite fall in, in the United Kingdom only about a month ago. And that meteorite uh, was managed to be collected, about 300 grams of that has been collected and it's in kind of a bit of a pristine condition. So there's going to be a lot of analysis going on in the next few months to see what molecules are in there. But we're not going to be very surprised to find many of the molecules that we, we would hope to find for the prebiotic chemistry in them. And indeed, many of the molecules that have been seen in the interstellar medium. So the evidence is that somehow chemistry is occurring out there in space. But if you go back to the 1960s and 1970s, the idea that this very rich chemistry could be forming out there was a real problem, and it still is today. Because first of all, space is very cold. The interstellar medium is, uh, you know, the, 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 the temperatures are typically a few tens of Kelvin or even just below 10 Kelvin. And it's very empty, so collisions between the molecules would be very rare. And both of that would lead to the thought, that, well, really, there shouldn't be much chemistry there, but clearly there is. But it can't necessarily be by the gas phase chemistry as we traditionally know chemistry. There are some important iron molecule reactions, and Wolf Geffert, uh, our leader of the EI, um, certainly works in that field, and iron molecule reactions are important and can occur. But they don't produce um, uh, some of the molecules that we need. For instance, even molecular hydrogen, which is the dominant molecule, we don't have an iron molecule reaction mechanism that would make enough of the hydrogen that we have uh, in our universe. So for about 20 or 30 years, the feeling has been that there has to be some other chemistry occurring. And the chemistry occurs on dust. Now, whenever we have, we go back to the nuclear synthesis picture, which was talking about in the JTEC people have we'll be talking about and studying in their new infrastructure. Um, we know there's lots of dust out there. It's the dust that, that shows the picture on the top here, where you, you kind of see a black space in space. It's not really empty like it looks there. It's just that we've got a big dust cloud covering up all the stars behind. And those dust are, are a remnant of, of, of dying stars, etc., as indeed are many of the chemical elements. And it's this dust which provides a surface on which we might produce our chemistry. And the dust grains look something like this. We've, we've collected interstellar dust grains and, and so on. Um, they look kind of fluffy, uh, very fractal, rough surfaces, typically 10 microns or something in size. So not a very nice surface to try and replicate in a laboratory. But we believe now, or we have the hypothesis, that it is these dust grains upon which the molecules, which we then subsequently see in the ISM, are formed. And indeed, it's those dust grains that coagulate in various ways to form the planetesimals and the planets and so on as well. And of course, we do sometimes get them to Earth on uh, micrometeorites. So this is our picture now of what we call the dust grain hypothesis. We have this dust grain. And on this dust grain, on the surface of this dust grain, the few molecules that we can make in the gas phase can coagulate, they can stick because it's very cold, um, and they can react on the surface. Or 
they can form an ice layer on the surface, which is then subsequently processed by some other energetic processing. And what other energetic processing do we have? Well, uh, we have other atoms and molecules landing on the surface that could induce some chemistry. That's the atom addition chemistry. We have light, um, either from other stars or when these dust clouds collapse to form new stars and the new star, if you like, switches on, it bathes the rest of the ice. Uh, that ultraviolet light has enough energy to trigger chemistry. We have a lot of ionizing radiation, cosmic rays out there, which can interact with the dust. We have shock waves from supernova and everything else, shock chemistry that can induce it. And all these things can lead to a thermal process, gradually the warming up of the dust grains and that thermal energy might lead to some ice chemistry. So we've got about a lot of about five mechanisms by which having formed these icy layers on top of a dust grain, we can actually do chemistry. Now that's only a hypothesis. So how on earth do we test the hypothesis? Well, we test the hypothesis in the same way that we test any other hypothesis uh, by doing um, experiments in the laboratory to try and mimic those conditions and test it. But producing, as we'll see in a moment, the conditions in the space are not easy. So we may not be able to absolutely replicate in the laboratory the conditions that we need for astrochemistry in space. So we have to combine those with models. And of course, we then have to test them against something. And what we do is test them against observations of these regions and look for the molecules that we believe we formed in the laboratory or the models tell us we should form. And we look for those in observations. So we have this rather nice triangle of observations, models and laboratory experiments, which underpins the field of astrochemistry. Now, I'm going to talk mainly about the experiments for the rest of this talk um, and give you some idea of what we do know and what we have done, but also what the challenges are and where we might go in the future. Now, the first thing to remember to do an experiment of trying to replicate the interstellar medium, or indeed, we could equally say replicate the conditions of a planetary surface like the Jovian moons or the Saturnian moons or maybe something like Titan. Um, we have to produce um, an experimental system um, which replicates those conditions as best as possible. Now, for the interstellar medium chemistry, um, the first thing we have to do is make a good vacuum. And, and typically that we, we can make a vacuum of 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 10 millibars relatively easily in the laboratory. But that's still nowhere near as good as empty spaces. Um, and so that's one of our first limitations. Uh, fortunately, most of the background, if you, if you do this correctly at the end, will be hydrogen, just as it is in the interstellar medium. The second thing is we need to be able to get down to the temperatures that these ice grains icy mantles might have in the interstellar medium or indeed on planetary surfaces. So we need to cool our system down to um, maybe as low as 10 Kelvin. And for that, we need to have a cryostat. Um, and uh, that again, you can make that uh, indeed the best ones today. You can you can run cryostatic cryostats now at uh, only a few Kelvin, five, eight Kelvin. Um, but again, it requires some experimental design. And then uh, we have to decide how we're going to probe what we've got in the ice. And the way of doing that is various spectroscopic techniques. And ideally, uh, we would like to have a spectroscopic technique that can, that can, that can measure the, the molecules in the ice all the time. Um, and that um, might be infrared spectroscopy or ultraviolet spectroscopy uh, to do that. Now, um, and, and you see here on the bottom left hand corner, a sort of a, a sort of an experimental chamber as we as we currently use. Uh, this is, happens to be one that we're using in, in, in Hungary, as you'll see in a moment. But essentially, it, it consists of a cold chamber, a cold finger uh, on which we have a, a substrate, which we put our ices on. And then we do the irradiation and we pass through the sub the ice and the substrate. And the substrate in this case is transmitting transmission. So it's something like zinc selenide, the infrared beam. So that means we're growing an ice film on a substrate, but that substrate is 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 not uh, a mimic of the dust grains in space, and we'll come to that. The next thing we need to find are the various tools to replicate the, the radiation sources that these ices might face. So if we want to look at starlight, if we want to look at ultraviolet light, 
um, we need to find a light source that um, is able to replicate the range and the frequency of the light that these ice grains might encounter in space or again on the surface or mimic starlight. And we can do that. Uh, here are two examples of ones that, that, that I use. The left-hand side is the Taiwan photon source and the right-hand side is the Astrid synchrotron facility here in Europe, in Denmark. Um, and typically the wavelength that we're operating from is between uh, 500 and 120 nanometers or close to the Lyman alpha edge. If I want to do irradiation of cosmic rays, I've got to find a source that's going to give me cosmic rays. So I need something that does ion beams. And this is just one. Uh, this is again, uh, one that I use and we've been using extensively uh, in the last two years um, as part of the Europlanet uh, research infrastructure. And this is at a Tomke in Debrecen in Hungary. It's a tandatron accelerator and it can produce protons, helium ions, and indeed heavier ions, uh, multiply charge ions of, nit of oxygen and sulfur. So that, for example, we can look at the magnetospheric ion interaction of the moons of Jupiter, um, which is part of the forthcoming JUICE mission. And the energy of the ions, we can vary between a few hundred keV to a few MeV. We also have another source coming online, also in Debrecen in the next in the next year, hopefully, which works at a slightly lower energies from one to ten keV, which is more again uh, appropriate to 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 um, uh, ionospheric uh, interactions and so on uh, on surfaces. But it also has the advantage that we can also do negative ions, which have also been discovered in space in the last decade. If we want to look at shocks, if we want to look at the effect of a shock, uh, so for example, if we want to look at what happens when some of these materials in, impose on a planetary surface, uh, meteorite impact or something, uh, then we want to, to, to fire IEC particles at high velocities in, in, to see what happens when they collide with things or pass through atmospheres. And we have, uh, again, across the world, we're fortunate we have different facilities. Uh, at my own university here in Kent, we have a light gas gun that can accelerate dust particles up to a few uh, kilometers per second, up to, say, seven say kilometers per second. On the right hand side, uh, India, uh, colleagues in India at the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, um, they, can, they can use um, a, a, a shock tube where they basically fire a, a jet of gas at, at Mach, uh, sort of uh, two to three, um, so that the, the, the gas itself impinges on the target and induces a shock. So we've got all these experiments that we can do. And so what I want to do for the rest of the talk is give you an idea of what we've learned and then also where we're going. Now, I can irradiate any of these ices that I can make in the experimental chamber that I've just shown you. I can irradiate them with ultraviolet light. I can irradiate them with ions. I can do some shocks. Um, and I can just look and see what sort of molecules I make, starting with the basic ingredients of the very simple molecules that are formed in, in space, um, maybe by ion molecule chemistry, et cetera. And a lot of the stuff out there is water. Water is the most dominant, but we've also got carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. We might have ammonia, we might have methanol, et cetera. These are all kind of simple molecules. So here's a very simple experiment, which I can do just irradiating a mixture of ice of water and carbon dioxide. So I can just take two of these molecules, freeze them out on the surface and take a simple infrared spectrum like this. And here I have some lines, some absorption bands in my ice, which is of carbon dioxide and water. And then I can irradiate it for about an hour. Now, in this case, this is done by protons, but I can, but it doesn't really matter what source you use. You could use photons above a certain energy. You could use X-rays. You could use um, helium ions. You could use electrons, and you will get something similar. And if after about irradiating for a period of time, and it, say typical experiments run for for minutes or hours, um, you will see a change in your spectrum because you start to make some other molecules. Well, obviously, the first thing you do is break up um, molecules like carbon monoxide and you make carbon dioxide. Then you've got an oxygen atom left over and that might form a CO3. And then the CO3 can uh, react and dissolve in the water and you can get H2CO3, carbonic acid. 
So here's a very simple binary mixture of ices, two very simple ices, exposed to almost any of the irradiation systems that you might find in space on the surface or in the ISM. And you can very readily make a slightly more complicated molecule like carbonic acid. And then I can warm the, the ice up. And if I evaporate off the carbon dioxide and the water ice, I'm left usually with some kind of residue. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the carbonic acid. And I can then characterize the residue by, again, the infrared spectra. And I know that all these peaks here align with carbonic acid. Um, and you can then look for this and think, well, that's a very simple ice. What about going out and looking and seeing this process actually happens? So Mars is a very nice uh, place to go because it's got ice caps and they're made up of basically water and carbon dioxide. So you might think that um, if you were a, if, if, if you had an ice cap of water and carbon dioxide and it was sitting there and being irradiated over several uh, years, you might make, make, make carbonic acid. And carbonic acid um, could be made that way or it could also be made in, in, in the atmosphere of Mars. And indeed, for, for people who have interested in the biology, uh, this is one of the signatures of the things that you might look for in rocks. You might see where this carbonic acid has been stored in rocks. We haven't found it yet, at least the Gale Crater hasn't found it. It doesn't seem to be carbonates, don't seem to be very prevalent there when perhaps they should be. But that's only one site, maybe we'll find more. So that's a very simple acid, very simple compound that we've made. But does that mean that we can go on in this very simple system to make much more complicated molecules? Can we make an amino acid? Can we create sugars? Well, the answer to that is there are lots of people doing these sort of experiments. Here's one on the left here of people using uh, ultraviolet light. This is a helium lamp irradiating the ice. And you can make compounds like here on the right from a mixture of ammonia and CO2. You can go on to make some some rather complicated compounds like ammonium carbamate, uh, NH2, NH2, CO2, uh, again, very readily. Other people, uh, like um, uh, Uwe Meyer Heinrich here, um, has done even more complicated ice systems. He's put together methanol, water, and ammonia on a dice particle and irradiated it with ultraviolet light. And if you irradiate it long enough, you can make up complex sugars like ribose. This is the experiment you can see here. Uh, and this is indeed uh, one of the molecules that 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 uh, you might expect to find on, say, something like a cometary surface. So in the lab, uh, we can uh, simulate what's going on in space. We can show that the basic molecules of life can be made relatively easily. And the first conclusion of that is, therefore, there's nothing really very special about our solar system or our planet or anything else because this could occur anywhere in any star planet forming system anything where you've got an is uh, got dust clouds covered in with molecules on their dusty surfaces being irradiated you can make some of these more complex molecules so we've got lots of experiments loads of experiments showing that if we take these various icy mixtures and we irradiate them with different uh, sources of energy we can make lots of rather interesting molecules but what did they tell us about how they're made? The answer is sadly, often they don't tell us very much. Um, they tell us what we've made, but they don't tell us how they things were made. And the problem with that is that when we start to work in surfaces rather than gas phase conditions, the parameterization of the experiments become harder. And often they're not very well defined. And this also means that often they're not reproducible in other laboratories. So uh, we can do an experiment and in our system, and then we can compare it with our colleagues in the United States or in Japan or across the earth, and um, they will get similar results, but they won't get the same results. Why is that? Well, the problem is that you have to define all the conditions of your experiment very tightly, and we're not necessarily very good at that. What, what can influence the rates of reaction? What can influence whether we go down one pathway rather than another pathway? Well, these are just some of the parameters that we might like to think about. What's the structure of the ice? What's, what's the ice morphology? Is it crystalline? Is it amorphous? Is it something in between? 
What about the temperature of the ice? Does it depend whether the ice is at 10 Kelvin, 20 Kelvin, 100 Kelvin? What about the vacuum environment that we do the experiments in? As I said, we don't really uh, make the conditions in space. So we know if we do our experiments at say 10 to the minus eight tor rather than 10 to the minus 11 tor, we might have some residual water. And so we might put down a molecule like benzene or something on the surface, but gradually during the experiment, we actually top it with a layer of water. Now, of course, in space, we could have the same. We could have molecules on the surface covered in, in water or, or on top of water. What, what, what would be the difference? And also the substrates that we are using for doing these experiments are not compatible with those in space. We do, we make things like the one of the top right here. It's a, it's, it's a zinc selenide surface. It's got some gold mesh on it uh, to, to avoid charging due to the ion irradiation in this particular case. And so we're growing our ice on top of a nice substrate so we can do some very nice clean experiments and we can do our spectroscopy. But that, or we could do gold and then we can reflect the infrared from the underlying uh, gold. Great for doing experiments, but it's not really what's happening in space. This is not the dust grain that you see in the bottom here. So we have some ideas of how we might do this. Uh, and one of the things is to do the experiments on dust itself. And this is a, an experiment designed uh, by a, a colleague of mine, Anita Dawes, uh, at the Open University, something we've worked on for, for some time, and she's now really pushing this ahead. This is where we, we, we use ultrasound to levitate dust particles. Uh, in fact, we, in this case, we are using soot um, as, our, um, as, our, uh, as our mimic of an interstellar dust particle. I think the first soot we took came from my grandmother's chimney. And uh, we put them, uh, we levitate them, and here you see a little levitator, it's just a standing wave between an ultrasonic generator and a reflection plate. And we set up nodes, a standing wave, and the particles stay there. And uh, then we, we coat them in ice and we look and see what we get. Um, and what we get is something rather strange because here we have an example of, the, of water on top of a dust grain made up of carbon. And if you measure the infrared spectra, it isn't the same as you get when you just put uh, water on a substrate in bulk form. As you see in B, we've got a dotted line, which is bulk ice in the amorphous form. We've got a solid line, which shows us a, a more sharper peak, which is when it's crystalline. But the red line is what we get if we put this soot ice at 200 Kelvin on top of soot. And on the left hand side, you see an observation of uh, water um, in space. And you will see um, that there is something here called the red wing excess. We have additional absorption in the red wing. And um, these levitation experiments match much more closely what we see in space than the experiments we do on pure uh, water ice, bulk ice substances. And then this brings us really to the challenges of doing the experiments and replicating them. So the substrate is one. The other problem is that the radiation fluxes that we use to do these experiments are much higher in the experiment. Indeed, they're orders of magnitude higher than either in the interstellar medium or even in the solar system. We have lots of time in space. Uh, we may only have an irradiation event uh, once per day or once a week. But we've got billions of years sometimes or to, to, to wait. Um, our PhD students and indeed our grant agencies aren't going to let us wait that long. So we have to speed it up in the lab. And we have to kind of assume that, that things just scale as the fluence. But that's not necessarily true. And so this is again where we need experiments uh, to be coupled together with models. If we grow an ice film quickly by just a big depositing on the surface, is that giving us the same morphology? And if we basically build our ice one molecule at a time, landing on the surface, rolling around the surface, stabilizing before the next molecule lands on top of it or on the surface. And we can only do that with molecular dynamic simulations and hope that the ice that we form is compatible in some way with the morphology of the ices that we have. The other thing is that uh, we now know 
that it really doesn't matter if you irradiate your ice with ultraviolet photons or X-rays or high energy cosmic rays. What really happens is you, when it hits the icy surface or the part or, or the grain itself, it liberates an enormous amount of secondary electrons, several thousand electrons for each incident particle. And it is those electrons that may actually induce the reaction chemistry and, for example, lead to the synthesis of glycine. So we can put down molecules on the surface, irradiate them uh, with electrons and see that we can readily convert it into glycine. So um, it isn't the primary particle that we've got to worry about. We've got to worry about the secondary electron. The other thing is that, that when we start to do these experiments, we don't always get answers that we expect or even understand. This is some work done by colleagues uh, in, in India, which uh, is a very peculiar uh, result. It's a compound called ethene uh, ile, ethene ile. Um, and you put that down on the surface and you warm it up to, to produce what we call temperature program desorption basically warming up your dust grain until it went to get into the gas phase. Now, when you do that, you might start with an amorphous ice, and then as you warm it up, you will get a phase change, and it will go to a, a crystalline ice. And that should be it. It shouldn't go back. And once you've got the crystalline ice, enthalpy and so on, it says, oh, it should stay like that. But this, a few molecules that have been found recently don't do that. Um, they kind of change backwards and forwards between amorphous and crystalline phases, depending, for example, on the thickness. So a thick ice shows shows little effect. Um, sorry, thick ice shows this reversible effect, whereas the thin ice does not. We don't understand that. And this leads to the idea that maybe there are some phases of the ice we might be metastable, ammonia being particularly one, where we might oscillate between the different phases. Another thing <coughs> is that when you freeze out molecules on the surface and they pack together, they might actually form little sub-island structures. This is an experiment, again, what we did a few years ago with, with um, Ralph Kaiser, who I think many of you will have heard of uh, in Hawaii. And it's a very simple experiment. We were looking to, to see how we could form ozone in space, because it might be suggested as a biomarker for astrobiology. So we froze out a thin a, a, a oxygen onto a surface, and then we irradiated it with electrons, and we expected to make ozone. And indeed, we do make ozone, but we don't make ozone on its own. We make the pure ozone, but we also made ozone in a dimer, two ozone molecules together, and ozone in combination with oxygen. And indeed, we found that the that that the temperature dependence was rather strange. The amount of ozone which we made was greater at 11 Kelvin than at 30 Kelvin. Um, and that was a surprise. And the argument is that basically what happens is that we form an oxygen dimer, O4 on the surface, which we can see spectroscopically at very low temperatures. And then when that dimer is broken up, one of the oxygen molecules in the dimer is associated, the oxygen atom reacts with its neighbor and produces ozone. As soon as we break up that dimer, and it's very weakly bound, so by the time we get to 20 or 30 Kelvin, it breaks up, we lose that dimer and the rate goes down. The other thing you can't really see too well on there, but on the right-hand side, is we made lots of ozone in the ice, but when we heated the, ozone, the ice up, we got a lot more ozone being formed in the heating process. And this tended to suggest to us that there were somehow some oxygen atoms trapped in the ice that hadn't reacted, but when we heated the ice up, they became more labile, mobile, moved to the ice and reacted. And indeed, we see this in quite a few of these systems where the molecules that we make at, say, 10 Kelvin, as we heat the ice up, we start to induce more chemistry with radicals and so on that might be trapped in the ice and start to move around. And this will depend upon the porosity of the ice and the type of uh, structure that the ice might have. So you can see that this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to cross-link experiments. There are so many different parameters of how we make the ice, of what the stru underlying structure is, the irradiation time, the heating rates. And this is our real problem, in, in I feel, in our astrochemistry community, that we're all doing similar experiments, but we're not doing the same experiments. And we've been thinking about this in the last couple of years, particularly, 
and try to come up with some many ways around it. The first one is is to obviously we rather than having one target in the in the chamber, so we can only do one irradiation at a time. What about putting in several uh, targets? So essentially, all the isos are formed under the same conditions, so we can do say four irradiation experiments on essentially the same ice at the same time, um, and that's what you're seeing here. The other thing we've coming up with is trying to design the experiments in a, in, in a way which we're copying with uh, from ideas being brought over from other areas of science, particularly, for example, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, where they have to have great big controls, very tight controls on the manufacturing process, and they parameterize all their parameters very carefully. And that's what we feel we need to do. We need to, to do a very systematic study of the formation of molecules as a function of each of the parameters to understand what is the driving process. So we need to study our reactions as a function of fluids, as a function of ice thickness, as a function of ice temperature, clearly as a function of energy, maybe in the case of ions, a function of whether they're singly or doubly charged. If they're a mixture, look at the difference between a water carbon dioxide mixture where you've got 10 times the amount of water from CO2 compared to 10 times the amount of CO2 of water. Because as we have seen in our, some recent experiments, that changes the reactions you get, synthesis you get, depending on which molecule is dominant. And apolar versus polar ices. We should look about whether the ice is, is, is evenly mixed or whether we've got layers. So again, uh, my colleague at the University of Nita has done some very nice experiments on benzene on top of water and compared it with water on top of benzene and then compared both of those with a, a mixture of the ice all mixed up. And you won't be surprised from what I've told you for the rest of this talk to find that we get different results if we do that. We also need to see whether we can, comp if the energy matters or, or if it's an energy driven process or it's the form of the energy that matters. So what about doing a radiation experiment where we compare irradiating with the energy from a photon comparing with the irradiation energy from a particle? So for example, uh, take your same ice mixture, irradiate it with nine EV photons and compare it with irradiating with nine EV electrons. Again, some recent work has been done by, by uh, people in Europe and America where this has been done. And indeed, you will see different pathways forming depending whether the energy comes in from the photons or whether it comes in from the electrons. And in fact, the electron yield is higher than the photon yield, it appears. What about the difference between injecting the atoms and the ions into the ice compared to liberating the atom ions in the ice by the photons and the electrons? Does it make a difference if we make the particles in the ice or whether we push the um, atoms and ions into the ice from outside? Now, ultimately, what I would like to see us do uh, in dream world is to do something which has been picked up by other communities to create an interstellar medium or planetary simulation facility that really does replicate the real conditions where we can put all the different things together we can do simultaneous irradiation the moment we've done these experiments either with a photon or with an electron what happens if i irradiate the ice simultaneously with a photon an iron a neutral beam and a shock because that's of course what actually is happening in space we don't just have a photon coming in one day and then an electron the next, we, we might actually bathe these things there. And certainly planetary surfaces are being irradiated by all these things simultaneously. So maybe we should be doing all these experiments simultaneously. And then we should do a complete surface analysis. Now this is a, the, 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 this idea of having a simulation facility that looks at all the multiple parameters at the same time and really accurately replicates the system is an area which our atmospheric uh, environmental science community colleagues have been doing for some time, particularly to mimic the effect of the Earth's atmosphere and to look at, for example, at the global warming or, or acid rain or um, ozone depletion. Here's an example of the Zafir chamber, um, which looks at um, the effects on uh, air formation of aerosols and secondary particle and pollutants. So it's a big chamber built to, to, to replicate the conditions you can even put plants and so on inside it but the but the essential thing is that you've got a centralized facility that really tries to replicate as close as possible the real conditions in the real world okay so just to finish we've now got my building blocks but the next question is how do they assemble so we've got all these little bits but how do they assemble to make the dna 
And the answer to that is we still don't really know. And, and this is where I'll hand this back to the rest of the AI community and the other astrobiologists listening to this talk. And I like to use this uh, analogy, which is a famous one, and people who know me have known I've used this some time. And this is the famous quote from Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, um, it was actually about uh, finding uh, nuclear weapons in Iraq. But there are no knowns. They are the things that we know. There are the known unknowns. That is to say, there are things we know we don't know. But the problem is the unknown unknowns. These are the things we don't know that we don't know. And I fear that that last one still is the thing that, that actually is our biggest problem for um, trying to work out how molecules assemble. I'd finish with, with some recent experiments or ongoing experiments that are being done, again, on these shock tube experiments um, by my colleagues in, in India. Where we've where we've skipped ahead, we've taken these these amino acids and everything else, and we've put them in, and we said, right, well, let's let's see what happens. How can how can they combine? So we'll put them all together, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll put some energy in, and we'll pass a shock tube, like it's a they're coming to say they're on a piece of dust or a meteorite coming into the Earth's atmosphere, and let's see what happens when they when we shock them and see what we make. Uh, so we can put together lysine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, arginine. Why did we choose those? Because we went back to the original book, um, which is the oral book, Origins of Life on Earth. I think most of you have probably either got it or, or seen it in the library. And they came up with these ones. So we just picked these ones from the book and we shocked them. And this is the sort of thing we're seeing. We're seeing that we start off on the left hand side here with this, this, this mixture of just ground up um, amino acids and other stuff. But when we shock them, we're making some remarkable structures. And what you're seeing on the right here is this typical structure uh, that we've made. This looks like almost like a nanotube that we've made somehow. And the only thing we've done is apply a shock wave, in this case with a carrier gas of nitrogen, onto these particles. And there was like some local shock temperature heating. And somehow we've married up all these other compounds. So, so we can see that once we've got these things, that that they can create structures. They can self-assemble these structures. We don't understand why. The other thing we're interested in is chirality. And uh, I showed you a picture of Uwe Meyer Heinrich. He's an expert in this. Because life has somehow emerged with this chirality. Uh, amino acids are left-handed. Nuclear sugars are right-handed. Um, why did? How did that arise? Um, again, I don't think we really know. There have been various experiments. And they say Uwe has been perhaps the best advocate of these experiments. I kind of feel that if we understood that a bit, we may understand a little bit more about the uh, about life because it gives us what we, life is a verge this way. So if we could understand how we can get that chirality, maybe it gives us some clues. So I hope in this kind of work through of astrochemistry in the last 50 minutes, I can uh, I've given you an idea about things that are happening. So astrochemistry um, as a topic um, predates astrobiology. The word has been around for longer. Uh, it's a mature field. There are many groups, many people in the world working on experiments and models and observations, trying to understand this rich chemistry in the interstellar medium and on other planetary surfaces. Um, it's a large and it's a growing community. Um, this is a picture of a meeting that we had in Cambridge. In 2019, it was an IAU meeting um, on laboratory astrochemistry. This is one of the last times as a community we could get together before we had the, the dreaded COVID lockdown. But one of the conclusions of that meeting was that we still need to coordinate our activities better if we're going to answer those fundamental questions that I asked at the beginning. And finally, uh, let's put it in the context of astrobiology. And this is a slide that I was given uh, maybe about a dozen years ago now which is a picture that was put together by um, some people, uh, senior people in the field on the origin of life on Earth and all the questions that we have to ask. So it's a kind of underpinning of the EAI. Um, and as somebody told me when they sent me this slide, you could pick one box or one arrow for your entire career. Um, and I guess I could pick the, the raw materials to prebiotic organic compounds at the top of this box. As, as what this talk has been about. And the rest of it is really all the other things that we need to study and indeed in the EAI, people are studying to understand what we, what we need to know to answer those two big questions. How did life 
construct itself from the simple chemistry and the building blocks to the very complicated structures that we have. And if that can, is that inevitable? Is that part of the process of when you've got a planet with these molecules, is it going to be automatic? Or is it going to be such a rare and uncommon event that, that possibly it doesn't happen in many places, if at all, outside our solar system in the rest of the universe? I don't want to end on a negative note, so I don't, I, I personally don't believe that we are so unique and the chemistry is so unique in our little bit of the solar system uh, that we are possibly uh, the only planet when, when there's many, many exoplanets out there where this chemistry cannot have occurred. We just don't understand at this stage how we got there. And I, that is the end of the presentation. Okay. Many thanks, Nigel. Hi, Will. And, and we are um, we are um, having now a possibility to ask questions, make comments. Either yep. you can do the question at the chat forum, or you can just switch your camera on, and we will then ask you to um, to uh, ask your question. So there is one question already by Antonio de Moraes. In labs, the irradiation experiments have definite intensities and energies and are run for minutes to days. But in space, the irradiations have multiple intensities and energies and there are for so many years. Please, are there plans to improve the experiments to simulate a little bit more close to what is observed in nature? Um, okay, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I did touch on it. Um, it is one of the fundamental uh, assumptions, I guess, that we always have to kind of make. Uh, and it may not be a good assumption. Um, so basically, if I irradiate um, a ice with 10 units of irradiation for one minute, um, that is to say, so 10, 10 units for one minute, is the same as one unit for 10 minutes, if you can see what I mean. So the fluids, doesn't matter how you put it in, it just builds up the amount of number of particles. Uh, once you've got, say, a thousand particles, it doesn't matter how long you took to put those thousand particles in, the chemistry will be the same. That is that is a that is probably not true because we know experiments where that isn't true. Um, and indeed, some experiments in, uh, in life sciences have shown that very clearly when you've irradiated cells, that doesn't work that way. Um, so we can't, but we can't do the experiments over very, very long time periods. Um, or but perhaps you know, uh, it'd be nice to be able to do them for perhaps longer uh, and test this. But I doubt that we'll probably ever get to the stage where we can do it on the such slow time periods as occur in space. And for that reason, we need models. So what we can do is do build a model, uh, which in which we can change the fluence, the flux. We can test the high fluences, high fluxes, and if the model and the experiments agree, we can then see what happens when the model runs at very slow periods. I say, I think one of my most classic ones would be, does the ice that I form uh, when I deposit it on a surface um, quite quickly, um, is the structure of that ice the same as I build up if I'm only landing a few molecules of water over a period of days, weeks, months? Um, that would be a very interesting, as I said, that's where we need to combine the two together. Okay. But it's okay. a very good question and it is a problem. So there is another question. Uh, how do you use the synchrotron to simulate Stellar irradiation, do you use a monochromator or just do Lyman alpha? Or do you an energy scan across the UV, UV range? Or even irradiate with the zero order broadband radiation? Uh, lots of questions. The answer to that is all of them. Um, and it depends on the flux of your synchrotron. Uh, when we first started to do those experiments, because again, the, the, the intensity of the synchrotron light is quite weak and we wanted to get to be able to see a signal, we used white light. But it's not true white light because you've always got windows in there, either lime and out, uh, lithium fluoride windows or magnesium fluoride windows. So you've got a cutoff. Uh, so you basically irradiate with a broadband radiation. 
But what you can do now is you you can get light sources which where the intensity is sufficient that yes, you can tune your monochromator so you could irradiate say with nine EV photons and compare it with nine EV electrons. Or indeed, and again, colleagues in America have been able to do this. You can buy plasma light sources which are more intense than a uh, than a uh, synchrotron source. Um, but they will give you, say, 6 EV photons, 9 EV photons, 12 EV photons, or something in between. And then, as I say, you can do those experiments to compare and see if the amount of molecules you make and the type of molecules that you make with the energy of the photon is the same as the energy of the electron. And that's, and that's produced some rather, there's a paper I got to referee only a few weeks ago that showed some very interesting results on that. Um, it will be published hopefully in the next few weeks. Of course, some people say, why don't you use a laser? Um, the problem with a laser is that's far too intense. You get multi-photon effects with lasers and you get heating effects from a laser, which of course are nothing like that you get from starlight. So the advantage of a synchrotron is it's, it's, it's tunable, it's intense light, but it's not so intense as to actually um, produce any multi-photon effects or any major heating effects. Okay, any more questions and comments? I, um, I would have any. a question. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I would have a question on the steric chemistry. Um, as, uh, maybe it's a silly question, but um, as I know it, uh, we only found uh, right handed amino acids so far in meteorites. So, uh, but life utilizes left handed amino acids. And so, I wanted to know, uh, or like to ask you if you could elaborate on how can then right-handed amino acid be elaborated or like used or utilized by life, or like how does it sample? I mean, then you have just the uh, molecules themselves, but how then life forms out of those, and how does it use it? That's a wonderful question. It's not my expertise, and I basically I don't think I have any. I have no idea, and I'm not sure many other people. <laughs> have good ideas, but there might be people in the audience who could answer it better than me, but you're absolutely right. It's a fascinating uh, uh, thing, uh, question um, of why that chirality has occurred and how it came about. There are some people that say that it's to do with maybe the way the molecules assemble, for example, on surfaces. Um, I think some time ago, people put forward some hypothesis about um, the way that the molecules might be assembled and scaffolded on things like clays. But it's certainly not an area I'm afraid I'm an expert in as I, I think, however, that it is one of those kind of hidden pictures. If we could understand that a bit, then maybe it gives us a fundamental clue to how the molecules assemble in the first place. Okay, that's enough. But, but yeah, I'd love to have more <laughs> ideas. Maybe, as I said, there may other be other people who can answer that for you in the chat, but it's uh, or, or any other way. But I think it's a very fascinating question. Thanks a lot. I've just seen Eddie Pross has just left. He probably could have answered that question better than me. Maybe I can say something. I will read. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, just to the question for the uh, chirality, I I think you, I don't know where you got the information. If I understood well, you think that right-handed amino acids have been found in meteorites so in fact both enantiomers have been found with a slight preference for the left-handed form and this the left-handed form is the one that we use in proteins so this is where the idea comes from that the selection of the left-handed form comes from space and several yeah. models are discussed for example circular polarized light yeah, and the circular polarized light experiments um circular dichroism experiments um were done by Uwe Meyer Heinrich on the Astrid uh, synchrotron. Okay, I showed a picture of it, and um, and he showed a slight asymmetry has been formed there, and that that's again one of the few experiments to actually um, possibly push us in that direction. And again, the idea is that potentially the light is polarized by um, interaction with the dust grains and um, the scattering of the light from the dust grains. Other people have an hypothesis that, that 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 basically there might be mechanisms that suppress one enantiomer over the other enantiomer, so you end up with an excess because one has been de degraded rather than the other one. 
but um, but 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 yeah, it's 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 a complicated um, system, and I say I'm not sure that we've got a lot of experimental evidence for for understanding it yet. Thanks, Cornelia. Nigel, uh, Bobby. Sorry? Hello. Uh, can you hear me, Bobby? Bobby here. Yep. Hi, Bobby. Uh, hi. Uh, just just uh, uh, doubt on the, the the reaction that happens on the eyes uh, when you have a projectile impinging on that eyes. Uh, does the chemistry happens on the eyes or just above the surface? I mean, no, it happens in the eyes. Uh, this is one of the things that we can we can look at. We can we can look at the um, particularly with iron iron beams. Depending on the energy, you can look at where in the ice uh, the the energy is deposited. Um, in the case of iron, this is something called the Bragg peak. In the case of photons, they don't penetrate very far. So the ultraviolet light is predominantly on the surface. It's a surface interaction. The ions, okay. on the other hand, or indeed the electrons, they can go right through the ice and and, and, and and penetrate right right through. And that's interesting because if they actually penetrate through the ice layer on top and they hit the substrate underneath, then they can liberate material from the substrate underneath. And of okay. course, in the dust grains in space, these ice layers are very thin. So it would not be okay. at all surprising that the that the iron the radiation, the iron, the particle radiation penetrates through the ice into the um, into the carbon or the silicate core and then liberates material from that. And again, if you look at the shape of those dust grains, they're not smooth, flat surfaces. So again, okay. if the ice is sitting on that, you might like to think that the whole thing is beautifully ice covered, but maybe it isn't. Maybe it's, um, you know, ice is on some parts or in some crevices and in other places it isn't, just like we find in comets, but on a micro scale. Okay. But the photon okay. chemistry we, we, is going to be in your surface layers. OK, OK, thank you. Hi, Nigel. I wonder if I could ask a follow-up question related to that. It's John here, by the way. Um, it's uh, related to um, the, the roughness of the surface of these ice grains. I, I wondered, is there anything known about a potential correlation between that surface area of the dust grain and the molecular complexity that you get um, in terms of you know building up these longer chained um, carbon nitrogen atoms. I don't know. That might be a difficult question, but I just wondering. Well, it's it, it's a difficult question, but thank you, John, because it's kind of spot on. Um, yeah, no, I mean it's a very good question um, about the fractal nature of these things um, and 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 what these surfaces look like. Um, we have no experiments. Uh, that basically give us any idea on um, on on the morphology of the underlying substrate, let alone the and how that might affect the ice. And the only way I think you're going to be able to do that is essentially to start to look at some high or some molecular dynamics modeling. Um, but I think it's a very it's a, it's a very good uh, question. Um, there is an analogy to it, to some of the work that people are doing um, on uh, atmospheric uh, chemistry and uh, the role of uh, sand and other dust in uh, atmospheric chemistry and pollution reactions, uh, where there have been some attempts to, 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 to do those levitation experiments I just talked about. Uh, and people are now trying to, to, to look at um, reactions on, on, on dust of different shapes and sizes and grain size and so on. But the first experiments are to look at the uptake of water on those grains and decide if that if that makes a difference or not. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a very good question. But no, at the moment I don't know of anybody. Again, this audience may well have experts who say, "Oh yes, we've looked at that," but I don't know anybody who's done it. But I think it's a very interesting uh, problem, as I say, because again, the mimic of your dust that you've got on that very rough surfaces. You know, we like to do it on 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 nice reproducible, um, flat, clean surfaces. Which of course are not an analog, but they are more reproducible. Uh, we can we can be sure, but you know we use one plate and we use another plate tomorrow. They are the same. Whereas if we were to 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 try and do it on a on a very rough surface, then yeah, you know every every grain may be different. But it's a very good question. It's, it's yeah. again one of those windows to push. But I do think that people doing the atmospheric chemistry experiments, where they're looking at um, 
doing some of these levitation experiments in Bristol, for example, in the UK, and I think in Würzburg in Germany, where they're just basically measuring the uptake of water on different on, on the same material, but different shapes. And that might be interesting to give us a bit of a clue. Mm, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Nigel. That's really helpful. Do we have any more questions? I don't see any other uh, questions coming up. So I would like then to close and I would like to invite, invite you to come in for another seminar in two weeks time where Geza Bertram who is leading our group, our, no, our project team on protoplanetary disks, will give a talk. For the moment, many thanks to Nigel, and see you then in two weeks. If thanks anybody has any further questions and they want to contact me, please feel free to do so. And uh, always looking forward to, to people who have ideas and to develop collaborations, as I say, uh, through the AI and through Europlanet. Thank you very much, Wolf. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending.